Resurrection Day. What a beautiful time to be together as followers of Jesus. You know, we can celebrate the resurrection every day, and we should. But today it's on the calendar, and, and we're reminded, and, and, and all the world over, we're specifically focusing on the greatest event ever in human history, which began with the sacrificial death of God the Son, our Savior, and ended with His bodily resurrection. It is finished. Salvation has been, been made available for sinners in need, of which you and I are indeed sinners in need. But by faith in Jesus and Jesus alone, we can be brought out of darkness into His glorious light. We can brought, be brought out of death into new life, born and adopted into the family of God, by God's grace, through His love that comes only by faith. Nothing we can do to earn it, but we sure can, like a free gift, receive it. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, know that He loves you, and He loves you just like you are. There will never be anything you can do to merit His love. You have it already. There won't ever be a way that you can clean yourself up. It's not even possible. But He'll take you just like you are. And if by faith you'll receive Him, if you'll trust Him with all of your being, place your life and eternity into His hands, then He will bring you into the family, and then He will start His work of transformation that only He can do, making you more and more like Him to His glorious grace. We praise Him today, for He is risen. He is risen. Yes, He is. If you've been with us the last few weeks, we've been studying the book of Daniel. We're going to continue that today. You may say, Pastor Kevin, this doesn't seem like that should be where we're at on Resurrection Day. Daniel, really? That's where we're going to be? Yeah, Daniel chapter 6 is one of the most recognizable accounts in all of the Scripture. You, you don't even have to have been raised in church Many in the Western world where Christianity has been proclaimed with freedom, many, having not even been raised in church, will know the account of this one named Daniel. And the night he spent in the den of lions. It's one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture, and it's better than that. It's not just a story. It's real. It's true, and it's, a, and it's an account, an Old Testament account of God's providence in the life of one of his faithful prophets. See, today I believe that God's people need to be reminded of God's deliverance, sometimes like Daniel, from death. And so we're going to look at Daniel chapter number six. And as we read through the chapter, I believe we're going to be able to find five principles that every follower of Jesus can put to practice in their life. As we read, I believe we'll be able to come away with at least five principles. You say, Pastor Kevin, I'm not a follower of Jesus. That's okay. You hold on with us. You, you stay tuned because we've got some really exciting more things to share with you. Right out of Daniel 6, some things that I think you'll find quite shocking. So just hang with us. But if you're a follower of Jesus, I want you to follow along with eyes ready to see God's Word from the Old Testament prior to the coming of Jesus, but let's come away with it with the principles that I believe God lays for us. Daniel chapter number 6, it says, It pleased Darius. You see, Darius is now the king over Babylon, or at least he's the governor under who I believe to be Cyrus the Persian. And Darius has come in and overthrown Babylon, who had taken the Israelites, the people of Judah, captive. And they had been captives for just about 70 years. But now there's a new king, a new government, a new nation in charge, the nation of the Medes and the Persians. Darius, I think, is a governor king that's from the, the Mede family line underneath Cyrus, the Persian king, who's the greater king. 
And so now Darius is setting up his government in the city proper of Babylon. And it says that he set up 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom. These are like under leaders. These would be under governors that would watch over all of the different areas of the kingdom. And over those 120 leaders, he set three high officials. So these are like a, like a supreme court, if you will, like a supreme set of rulers underneath the king governor Darius over the 120 under leaders, of whom Daniel was one. You'll remember if you've been with us that Daniel and his three friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, were four of the Israelites that were taken captive in Babylon's first invasion of the, of the nation of Judah. And these four young men have grown up and God has shown them favor because they have been faithful to God even in dire, difficult circumstances. And so now Daniel, who had ascended the ladder under the Babylonian king, is doing the same thing under the Medes and the Persians. He's ascending right back up to the upper leadership. And it tells us that this Daniel uh, was one of those three to whom these satraps, these under governors, would give an account so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps. Why? Because an excellent spirit was in him. When we left off in chapter number 5, the Medes and the Persians under Darius's control came into the city of Babylon, overthrew Babylon, killed the king that was in charge in the city whose name was Belshazzar, and, and it just had happened that Belshazzar had lifted and raised Daniel up. So I'm imagining that as Darius is coming into the city and he's looking around going, okay, what's going on here and who are you? Well, my name is Daniel, sir, and why are you standing up on the stage? Well, I've been a part of the leadership here in Babylon for a number of years. I've served the kings here, and and, and I just had interpreted a dream that the king dreamed, and it it, it came true, and and here I am. And I'm just imagining Darius said, I'm going to set you over here. You might prove valuable to me. That's exactly what Daniel became, valuable to King Darius. Why? Because he had an excellent spirit in him. That means that he had an obedience and a grounding in the worship and and faithfulness of the God he served, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Japheth. And you could see it. Even this new foreign deity or foreign ruler could see his allegiance to the deity he called Yahweh. So Daniel was climbing the ladder, and he was way up at the top. And in the same verse, it says, And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. He had three upper leaders, these Supreme Court upper echelon. There were three of them, and Daniel was so valuable that King Darius was about to to raise him up to be the one over the other two, over all the 120, and rule the whole kingdom with him. So Daniel, following and serving his Lord, was seeing and experiencing success. But verse number 4 tells us something that happened. It's very similar to what happened in chapter number 3. When you'll remember King Nebuchadnezzar set up an image to be worshipped. There were three in the kingdom that refused to worship that image. There were those that knew they refused and were hoping they could move these Hebrew exiles, these these people from Judah out of the way. Again, as Daniel is ready to be raised up to this highest level, verse 4 says, The high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground of complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. We don't like it that he's about to be raised higher than us. He's about to get a promotion. We should have been up for this promotion. We've been around here longer. We know this king better. We're even people of Babylon. He's an exile. He's a slave. That's not fair. Let's see if we can set up a way to find some wrong and error in him. You know, after the midterm elections with any presidency, you always start to hear the dirt be scraped. Because in two years, somebody else is going to be uh, jockeying for the White House. 
And they begin to pile up dirt on one another. They begin to look for any and every little thing they can hold against another candidate. That's what these guys are looking for. They're looking for dirt against Daniel. Surely, Daniel has some dirt that we can throw at him to get him off the fast track to being first among us. The verse says, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Does that mean Daniel was sinless? Not at all. Daniel was a, 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 a creature that was broken by sin just like you and I. But, but what this is saying is, is that Daniel was walking with his God. And, and while he certainly wrestled with sin, there was nothing that he was doing in his life that could be clearly marked. When, when we come to the New Testament... And, 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 and Paul is writing to Timothy, giving him instructions on who should and should not be in church leadership. He never says that you should choose folks that are sinless because you'll always be looking and never find someone to fulfill those roles. But what you do need to do is look over the totality of their life and see if there are any glaring holes, if there are any glaring pitfalls that are going on. And those that you find no, no major, uh, 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 major ordeals, those are the ones that you might set aside and consider for leadership. Daniel was one of those guys. Daniel was one of those guys that when you went looking for something, you just weren't able to find anything. Principle number one, if you're a follower of Jesus today, if you know this God by faith in God the Son, principle number one is this, there is never a substitute for character. There is never a substitute for integrity in the life of a Christian. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've been called. It tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 and verse number 20, it tells us that you've been called to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ. You've been called to represent in this place the kingdom for which your citizenship is found. And that's the kingdom of our Savior, the kingdom of our God. There's never a substitute for character. If you're a follower of Jesus today, we've been called not to be sinless, but to pursue sinlessness. See, God knows that we can't in our own strength avoid all sin, but we sure can try. And as we try, we will be more and more ambassadors of our Savior. And when we try to avoid sin, you know what God's going to do? He's going to, through His Spirit, empower us and encourage us and strengthen us to that end. And when we fail, when we fall, and we will, He'll be right there to pick us up, dust us off, and set our feet back on that path with Him. Pursue character. Pursue character, follower of Jesus. But they couldn't find anything wrong with him. Verse number 6, these high officials and satraps came together and decided in agreement to go to the king. Let me read verse number 5. Ladies, let's go back. These men said, we can't find any ground for complaint against Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. So there's nothing that's glaring at us. So what we're going to have to do is find something that he does that can offend because of his faithfulness to his God. So they got together. Verse number 6, they came to agreement. They came to the king and they said, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects, the satraps, the counselors, the governors, are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction. King, we've come to you today and we've talked amongst ourselves and we're all in agreement. Well, they weren't all in agreement, but nevertheless, that's what they said. We're all in agreement that you should write an ordinance. You, O oh king, should write an injunction. And here's what that injunction should say. Whoever makes a petition to any god or man for 30 days, except you, O oh king, shall be cast into the den of lions. These leaders came to the king. And, and I'm thinking that this is early in his rule over these people that he has just conquered, the Babylonians and all of the peoples that they were uh, oppressing. Now he's in control. And I'm imagining what they're saying is, King, 
One of the best ways that you can get everybody on the same page, your page, O King, the way you can get them all going in the same direction, your direction, O King, the way you can get everyone knowing who's in charge, you're in charge, O King, is to sign an ordinance that says, No one can look to any God or any person for their guidance other than you, O King. You have to be the one that they are looking to with complete and total and utter allegiance for one month. And anyone who disobeys this order should be executed by being cast into the den of hungry lions. I don't think that primarily... They were playing on Darius's desire to truly be worshipped. Yes, these kings in this area did see themselves as the high representative of their deity. And sometimes they would fall into the trap of allowing people to worship them. But they weren't trying to talk him into believing he was a god. They were just trying to talk him into a strategy for making the people line up and know who's boss. And I'm thinking the king is mulling those ideas over. And You know what? That sounds like a pretty good idea. I, I, I mean, those that follow different gods won't mind setting them aside in order to, to follow me and the gods that I serve and look to my leader. So it shouldn't be a problem. And a month, that's a negligible amount of time. Now, O king, verse number 8, establish the injunction, sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Okay, king, we've brought some parchment. We've got a pen. We're ready for you to write it out and sign your name. And remember, once you've signed it, it cannot be revoked, not even by you, O king, because that's the way it works in the government of the Medes and the Persians. Once it's signed... It's set, and it cannot be undone. Those of you who have been around church for a while will remember this same kind of thing happening with a Persian king under the, uh, the time of, of Queen Esther. He signed a document that also could not be undone. But back in our time, we, we've got the paper king. We, we brought all the supplies. All we need you to do is to sign this, to write it out, and put your name there. Verse 9, therefore, King Darius, sign the document and injunction. Verse number 10, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he knew what it said, he knew what it, went, what it meant, and he knew the ramifications on his life himself. It says he went to his house where he had windows in the upper chambers toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. We can't find anything at fault with with Daniel. What are we going to do, guys? How are we going to get this guy out of the way? I know what we'll do. We'll figure out something that he does in obedience and allegiance to his God. And then we'll make that illegal. And then when he does that, then the king will be on the hook. And he'll be the one that has to get rid of him. And that's what they did. They knew Daniel prayed. It was no secret. He wasn't doing it in solitude. He prayed every day. He probably talked to them about his God. He tried to do, probably tried to do his best to convince them of the superiority of his God. He might have even reminded them of the story of his three Hebrew buddies that were caught in the, the fiery furnace and yet were not even burned up. In fact, that might have even got to the king. Daniel did what Daniel had always done. And now that it was against the law, no change was made in Daniel's allegiance to his God. Christian principle number two is this. If you're a follower of Jesus, you need to hear this. If you're not walking with God prior to persecution then you're not likely to start once persecution comes. If you're not walking with Jesus, if you're not ordering your life according to His Word now, 
when things are free and, and, and it's able to be done without any major opposition, then when persecution and consequences arise, you're not likely to begin then. In fact, what you and I are likely to do is to cower and bow to whatever is put before us. If you're a follower of Jesus, look at this example and see that what he was doing He had always been doing. And then when the heat was turned up, he knew that he could continue to trust in the one that he served. Walk with Jesus now, Christian. Persecution has to come. Jesus said, if you follow me, they're going to hate you. There's no way around it. If if your hope and your plan is that Jesus is going to come and you're not going to be here because we're going to miss persecution, then you need to wake up. Persecution is right outside the door and it's not slowing down and it's not going to get easier and it's going to be harder and harder every day of your life and mine to stand up for Jesus. And if we don't do it now... It's not likely we're going to do it then. So let's rally beside one another. Let's encourage one another. Let's let's draw one another. Let's pull folks out of our lazy chairs and say, no, we're following Jesus. You're going with me. So that when the time comes, we'll already be in the motion and we'll be ready to stand on no matter what. So that's what Daniel did. He just prayed. Verse number 11 Then these men came by agreement. Yeah, they knew what he was doing. They found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. You know, I don't think Daniel was doing was crying to God. I don't think Daniel was there going, God, they're mad and mean to me. They're picking on me. I just don't think he was. I mean, brother had just assailed to the highest levels. God has shown him favor. His boy's been in the barbecue and didn't burn. I'm just thinking Daniel's going... Okay, Lord, here I am. And and, and understand, Daniel's been in Babylon for over six decades. This isn't a teenage boy kneeling down to pray. It's a dude nearly 80, if not already in his 80s. I imagine Daniel's going, I'm ready, Lord. I'm tired of this place. (laughs) I'm ready to get out of here. These people are weird, okay? So whatever. You know what they said? You know, I know they're coming for me. They don't like me. But, but you're with me, and I trust you. I don't know what Daniel said, but I, I think it probably sounded something like that. Verse 12, then they came near, said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? Did, did you not say that? The king answered and said, yeah, yeah, the thing stands fast. I I did that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. You can almost hear, these were these kids growing up, You know what had to have been on their lips in about the second and third grade. Teacher, teacher, she's not doing what you said. These little tattletales have grown up into just a couple of jerks representing any of the others that were following along. King, didn't you sign the injunction? Yes, I did. What's the point? Well, the point is that Daniel, who's one of those dirty exiles, not one of us, he's one of those nasty slaves that were brought to Babylon. He don't care what you say, O king. He don't care what you think. He don't care who you are. He's just going to pray, pray, pray every day. He just don't care what you do. Christian principle number three. Followers of Jesus need to expect to be maligned and slandered as wrongdoers. You need to expect that if you're going to follow Jesus and you're going to put the principles of God's Word to work in your life, you need to expect to have that twisted and you to be presented as a wrongdoer. 
Do you have a television set? Do you watch the new? I know y'all on social media. I see you post. I'm watching. Yeah, you know it's happening in our world. That wheel is turning. You're looking and you're going, I, I'm just following Jesus. I, I'm just trying to love folks like Jesus would love them. And you got everybody and their sister standing around going, he's a racist, she's hateful, and nobody loves anybody, and they're all mean, and they're all bad, and they ought to be shipped away. And you're going, I'm following Jesus. You know what Jesus said? If you follow me, they're going to hate you. You know why? Because they hate me. They hate me. Now just let, if you know Jesus as your Savior, let that sink in. How in the world can anybody hate the Lord Jesus? I'm going to tell you why. Because they love darkness rather than light. You say, shame on them. Don't let them words come out of your mouth. Don't even let them sit long in your head because you were and I were one of those who love darkness rather than light. And it is only by God's drawing grace that we were willing to trust by faith in the salvation that he provided. But if you're a follower of Jesus... You need to be walking with God so that when the real persecution hits, you don't run and hide. And on the way to the persecution, before it ever gets here, you need to expect to be misunderstood, slandered, and made the bad guy. Then the king, verse 14. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed. The king had an unusual love for Daniel. Because I think he saw in Daniel something he'd never seen in anybody before. He had conquered all kinds of people. He he had seen all kinds of temples be burned and, 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 and people that bowed down to all types of different gods, act all kinds of different ways. He had never come into contact, I don't believe, with anybody like Daniel. He saw something special in him. He obviously thought he could trust him. He was about to make him second in his kingdom. And now he's the guy that's being brought to him because of the thing that he had allowed himself to be talked into. Now his heart was broke. He'd been taken. And he knew it. And he was distressed. And he set his mind to deliver Daniel. I imagine he's pulling all the law books down. He's looking for a loophole. My goodness, you dirty rock. Okay, i got to focus my energy. i got to find a way to get this innocent man. That was never my intention. I, w- I was never wanting Daniel not to be able to pray to his. I was so stupid. i got to find a way out for him. And he looked and he searched and he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Now, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king established can be changed. I know what you're doing, but you're not going to find a way out. We got this thing locked tight. Daniel's guilty. You know what the law said. You know what you wrote. Then the king commanded. Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God in whom you serve continually deliver you. He didn't have any choice. He brought Daniel to what was probably a pit in the ground with a a wall that separated and made two sides in the pit. The the wall, likely, if it's anything like these contraptions that were found in southern Europe, you could walk across the wall and there was a gate that you could pull up that would allow whatever beasts, in this case lions, to move from one compartment to the other. And then you would put the wall back down. And so what typically would happen is you would drop the person or whatever you were doing down into one hole. And then you would lift up the, the, uh, the, the center door and the hungry lines would come through and find whatever was waiting for them. 
He didn't have any choice. He was in a corner. I'm imagining, and again, doesn't say it, it's obvious this king cares for this man. I, I'm imagining that, that he's broken. He knows what's about to happen to this innocent, elderly, faithful, gifted, uniquely loving old man. And I think the king probably wept as he watched Daniel lower down on one side. Hearing the hungry, starved lions. It, it, it wasn't the execution that bar, bothered the king. Oh, he'd probably done this before. It was that an innocent man was about to get devoured. It was his fault. He says, Danny, I sure do hope that God that delivers that you serve. I don't know how he's, I don't know how he's going to do it. But I hope he delivers you. I hope, he br- I hope he brings you through it. I'm so sorry. Notice that they took that stone. Verse 17, they laid it on the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet, with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. He couldn't make an opportunity for the king to send his men out to get him out in the middle of the night. No, they had to put a top on this hole so that what the king said was going to happen was going to happen. And Daniel would be removed and we would be able to take his place. We got him. It's done. The king went home. Verse 18. He went to his palace. He spent the night fasting. Now, don't bring me any food. I can't imagine eating right now. And no diversions were brought to him. None of the stuff that, that he was normally used to having of entertainment or whatever was, was to pass. Out. Don't bring anybody. Just leave me alone. And he stayed there. Wide awake. Because the verse says that sleep fled from him. Christian. Principle number four, following Jesus will cost you everything. That's the deal, you know. You you, you lay down your broken life in order to receive new life, new life in Christ. And and, and that costs you everything of your broken life. And Jesus said, "But, but why would that be a problem? One of his own servants in, in the 1950s, a man by the name of Jim Elliott said, Nobody's a fool to give up what they cannot keep in order to gain what they cannot lose. I'm going to say it again. You're not a fool to trade something that you can't keep in order to gain something that you can't lose. Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, pick up your cross. You're going to need it. Follow me. Yeah, but but Jesus, that might lead to my death. Yeah, I know. But guess what? That's not going to be a problem. We celebrate. Why? Today. Christianity, following Jesus, will cost you everything. But Jesus has already said, you try to keep your life, you lose it. But if you'll lose your life for my sake, well, then you'll find it. Because you'll find that life in me. And so Daniel was lowered into the, to the hole. The king went home sad. Then at break of day, verse 19, the king arose and went with haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. He had a sliver of hope, but no real faith. I mean, he's crying out, Daniel! Servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, has he been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, Oh, yeah, he's able. (laughs) He's more than able. You see, the king was not the only one fasting that night. Why? Daniel said, my God, verse 22, 
sent his angel. Now, I know it says he sent his angel. Remember, you remember in the furnace? There were three thrown in. There were four walking around. We said, we don't know. It was an angel or could it have been Jesus? Could it? Well, sure it could. I'm, I'm just going to let my mind go there that, that while Daniel's describing an angel, he don't know who he's looking at. He don't know who he's talking. I'm just going to believe that that was the pre-incarnate Jesus God the Son. And then when I get to glory and he's looking at me and he's got this long list of stuff, he's going, no, son, you are all together wrong. That just had to be one of them. <laughs> Until then, that's the way I'm going to roll. I like to think that this angel was one that came in that was touching the lions as they went from one room to the next. I like to think he called them by their name as he come through. You know, hey there, Spot. Hey there, Fluffy. Hey, Stinky. I know you. Come on in. Come on. Yeah, you just sit over there. And I'm imagining these hungry lions that thought, food! We're going, why have I suddenly lost my appetite? And I'm just imagining in my own mind, Jesus if he was the one saying, you know, folks are going to refer to me as a lion one of these days. Yeah, I, I can see why. You, you're a good boy. You're a good girl. Just lay down right there. In my imagination, I'm going, that night, that thing that we're looking forward to, a time when the lion lays down with the lamb, wouldn't that have been cool? The Lamb of God nuzzling up to them hungry, but strangely not ready to eat. And Daniel just lays in it. Look, I'm making all that up. Here's what Daniel said. An angel came. He shut the lion's mouth. I thought I was done for. Nah. We've been here all night. We've been snuggling. I'm right here. Shut the mouths of the lions and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And before you, O king, I've done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found in him because he had trusted in his God. From a certain point of view, he was put down in death and brought up alive. But he was alive when they put him down. He was still alive when they brought him up. Verse 24, And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel. Let this sink in. Those men were brought and cast into the den of lions. They, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. You see, in these verses right here, we get the point of the chapter that was being written originally to God's people in exile. Teaching them how they would to continue following him regardless of the circumstances that they were in. Here's the point of the chapter. God is speaking and saying, remain faithful to me. I am able to deliver you. Keep your eyes on my kingdom that is to come and wait patiently and faithfully for the one through whom it will arrive. And do not worry, I will deal with those who oppose you according to my will. That's the point that the Israelites should hear. The people of Judah should say, Okay, another example of God delivering. I'm to keep my focus and trust Him. Keep my eyes on His kingdom and the one who's to bring it about. And don't worry about those that oppose me. God will deal with them in His time. But it brings me to principle number five, follower of Jesus. And here it is. The resurrection of Jesus Christ stands as your guarantee and my guarantee of absolute and total deliverance from the same God in our time no matter what.
because Jesus defeated death, we have the promise of that deliverance. So it doesn't matter what happens, death, life, opposition, persecution, no matter what, we have been redeemed and will be delivered, if not in death, on the other side of it. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, which I found interesting, the parallels between the life of Christ and the conclusion of his life and ministry and the life of Daniel. Let let, let me bring some of these up. Jesus also had jealous high officials conspire to kill him, but they could find no fault in him. Jesus remained completely faithful and surrendered to his Father. And he was sinless. He is perfect and he always will be holy. I see that Jesus also was insulted by his accusers. He was slandered and he was lied about. I see the man in authority over Jesus knowing that he was not a criminal. And looking for any and every way that he could deliver Jesus from that brutal, cruel death. I see that Jesus was also innocent. And yet he was sentenced and suffered death. A stone was also placed to secure his grave. And it was also sealed with the signet of the governor. I see that Jesus' followers went to the grave early in the morning with little hope and no faith whatsoever. I see that Jesus' followers were amazed, even more so than the king, to find that he had risen from the dead. And I find that one day, those who will reject him can expect to experience His divine justice. But today, they get to hear the invitation that says, Come to me by faith. Come to me. Lay your life down. Let me give you new life, forgiveness, and salvation. I love the story of Daniel. But the greater Daniel has come. The more faithful servant has come, went to the grave, and was raised victorious. And the verses that follow, we won't read them. King Darius said, I want everybody to understand, from now on, everybody in my kingdom is going to fear and know the God of Daniel. He's a living God. His kingdom is over all, and His kingdom is forever. Philippians 2 tells us that God highly exalted His Son. That at His resurrection, He was brought to a place that He can never be brought from again. And when it is time, everybody, everywhere, every knee will bow and confess That Jesus is Lord of all. But we can do that today. We can experience that today. So what's the response? Here's your response. Number one, if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, today's the day to recognize, I don't have it, but I need it. He's the one who's got it, and it's free, but I can only receive it by faith, trusting in Jesus, and Jesus alone through his death and resurrection. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, today's the day to trust Him by faith. If you do know Jesus as your Savior, today is the day to renew your faith. I would invite you to hear and know that God loves you and wants you to walk with Him so that you'll be ready for whatever is in store for you. But you got to move some of that junk that's got you distracted out of the way. It could be sin. It could be pursuits that don't have anything to do with Him. And he says, keeping you from focusing on me. Today would be a great day to say, God, I want to confess that is sin. I I, I want to admit that that's in my way. And and I want to ask you to set my feet on the straight path so that my life can be used for you and you alone for your glory so that I will be ready for whatever you call of me. 
I won't be on time. I won't be right when it's time to serve you in whatever way you see fit. And then I want to encourage every one of us to leave from here today standing in confidence in the one who has and will deliver. He lives, y'all. He lives, y'all. You ready? One more time. He is risen. Stand with me, if you will. Father, we come to you today. We ask that you will move in our hearts, that we might see and hear from you. I pray you'll give us the courage to respond. Nobody's looking around. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. Do you need to trust Jesus as your Savior? Maybe you would say, Pastor Kevin, I've never trusted Jesus before. I've never asked him to save me. But by man, I believe. I believe he died, and I believe he rose from the dead. I believe what he did in Daniel's life is real, and I, I want to trust Jesus and Jesus alone right where you're at. It's as simple as this. God, I'm a sinner. I'm broken, and I can't save myself, but I believe that you have provided salvation for me in the person of your son, God the Son. I believe he died for me, I believe you raised him from the dead to prove that his sacrifice was enough. And I trust in Jesus and Jesus alone. Forgive me and save me. I surrender. If that's your heart, if that's your desire, God's Word says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And if that's you today for the very first time, please don't go home without coming and telling me. I wore a jacket and tie for you today. Come tell me that you trusted Jesus. Because I want to know that. I want to get excited about that. Christian, do business with God. This could be the start of something brand new. So, Father, we ask that you will move us from where we are to the place you desire us to be for your glory. Give us courage to call sin what it is. Give us the ability to recognize those things that are standing in the way of your control of our life. Let us call them worthless in comparison to what you want to do. Then give us the courage to put one foot in front of the other, following you and you alone in all areas of our life, those of us who know your Son is Savior. And let that first step be the one we take going out the door. We thank you for the day. We look forward to continuing to celebrate the resurrection until we see it with our very own eyes. We look forward to that day. May it come quickly. For it's in the name of Jesus, our King, our Savior, that all of Oasis Church says, Amen.